My name is Alix Peabody, um, a strange first name right now, A-L-I-X, was curious. Um, I'm the founder and CEO at Bev, and uh, we're a company in the beverage space, uh, really trying to change the dynamic around how women have been represented, um, particularly in the alcohol industry for a very long time. It's an extremely male-dominated space. Um, so we're really trying to change the way that it's been marketed and, um, you know, and represents women all the way from the drinks that we make to the way it's distributed and down to the bar itself. So. Hi, I'm Sean Kane. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Launch LA. We are a CPG studio, so we go out and we look for white space. Uh, we work closely with retail and we launch brands. Uh, a handful of the brands that we've launched in the last, I would say, uh, six months, nine months. Hello Bello is uh, it's our flagship baby brand. We launched that with Kristen Bell and Dan Shepard. Uh, Taffers, it's actually an uh, alcoholic seltzer line and non-alcoholic drink mix with John Taffer from Bar Rescue. Uh, and we launched um, another business called Tiller and Hatch, which provides access to high quality, affordable meals that we launched with uh, Jennifer Lopez and Alex Rodriguez. Uh, before that, I was co-founder of The Honest Company. Uh, it's where I kind of picked up some experience in brand development, product development, um, and retail development. So glad to be here today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pollan, a co-founder and the CFO and CEO of Launch.LA. Sean gave a brief overview of that. I think you know the idea was launched is we um, create a platform where we can combine retailers with A-list celebrities with you know good products and along with our expertise and also a direct-to-consumer platform all at the same time and all get that all together right before launch and so we have kind of make a big splash at the point of launch but we uh, manage um, these brands from inception all the way to launch and then you know hopefully through you know maturity um, Prior to that, uh, prior to this, it seems like it was a long time ago, but really it's since the beginning of the year we started this company. I was with uh, Aries Management, it's an alternative asset manager for the last 17 years, so it was my entire career I was at one company. Um, looked at you know thousands of companies, invested in you know probably several hundred of them, and um, decided this year that it was time to make that leap. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Jessica Chang, CEO and co-founder of WeCare. We are a managed marketplace for early childcare. So when we decide to have kids, um, or when you guys have kids or decide to have kids, it's a really big problem. Um, in the US, 51% um, of the US actually falls in a childcare desert, which means that for every three kids looking for care, there's actually only one spot available. And a lot of times, what ends up happening is women will have kids, and then they decide to leave their career because either one, childcare was not available, or two, it wasn't actually affordable. So for us, we wanted to actually fix this problem. So we wanted to create, on one side of it, um, affordable and convenient options for parents. And then on the other side of it, we wanted to support the teachers to start and manage their own home daycares, and then really let them focus on care while we focus on everything else. You know, when Antonio was speaking, I thought, how do we follow that guy? But I think you've got a great panel. So let's start with the leaks. So you touched upon your mission and what's so special about your company, but let's elaborate more on that. Why is it important for your brand to exist? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, I also thank you, thank you all for having me. My first two employees who I met in a coffee shop were from LMU. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so, it's a place uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, but anyway, you know, I think it's a funny industry because it's one that everyone interacts with and nobody really knows all, all that much about, if you think about it. Um, you know, everyone in some way, shape, or form, you know, has been to a bar or a restaurant seen the wine menu or the back bar and and the next time you go um, into one of these places I urge you to just to look at the back bar in a bar right and just see see what's there you'll see Johnny Walker you'll see Casamigos you'll see everything kind of like brown 
and white and silver um, for the most part, and it's all heavily, heavily male branded, right? And and my kind of theory, when you stop to think about that, even when you're walking through the grocery aisle, um, is you know what does that say about whose space that is in, in reality, and what does it say about um, you know the, the industry at large when every single product that comes out is really really male oriented there's nothing that has a brand that speaks to and empowers women uh, and i think it's it's also an industry that's for so long capitalized on on people's insecurities rather than their strengths so even you know even the well branded products out there for men tend to be you know like sports or, or whatever it is right and um, and and to me that's that's something that really um, is a problem in our culture because it trickles all the way down to the consumer, it trickles into toxic masculinity, it, tr it trickles into date rape culture, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so for, for my company and for my mission, you know, I, I got into beverage by accident, but really what I care about and what the company cares about is changing the paradigm about how people interact with each other when they're socializing and when they're guards down and, you know, and, and when they're drinking. So that's, that's a little bit about why, why I care. Thank you so much. You know, we've had, uh, we've launched a few product companies uh, at LMU and among LMU graduates. It's really hard to get initial awareness and distribution. So how are you managing those challenges? Have, have any of you heard of Bev, just out of curiosity? Uh, clearly not. <laughs> clearly, clearly not well. <laughs> um, uh, we, we actually just got a new office behind, right behind the Venice sign, so when you walk by, you can't miss it. I just decided that I was going to paint an entire building bright pink to get the point across. Um, so, so you'll see it there. But um, you know, awareness is a tricky thing for sure. Distribution is for sure a trickier thing. I'm sure you guys are are interacting with this, but um, it's an industry that's also uh, it's grandfathered in from prohibition, right? So, and, and all of the distributors, generally speaking, are family-owned companies, male-owned. I don't think there's a single dis distributor owned by a woman. I don't, literally not one. And there are these billion-dollar companies owned by, like, a group of brothers, right? And, um, and so, you know, half of it is getting them a product that they can be excited about, um, you know, and, and you're up against people who, who make the bread and butter, you're up against Constellation, Diageo, all of this kind of stuff. And so the best thing that you can do is just differentiate yourself. And getting a product to the shelf um, has a lot of different steps. And and it, when you think about it, the person who's delivering it on the floor, right, is not the same person who's taking you on as a brand. And so there's just so many levels of, frankly, I think, at the end of the day, just like being good to people and getting people excited about your mission and your brand. And that's what's actually going to get the distribution on the floor, but it is for sure a challenge. Well, well you've got a colorful can, yes. uh, the name Bev, I guess sounds like beverage, but also is a name of a, a female name, right? Yeah, that, yeah that, that was the idea. I wanted it to be like a cool chick name that's a little retro, but also if you know someone named Bev that you don't like, it's you know, it's a beverage. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, you also raised a lot of money. Yes, yes, that, that I did, that I did do. <laughs> you just mentioned the amount? Maybe? Yeah, um, I, so I, I, our first round was just under $3 million, and our most recent round was a seven, so we've, just, we, we've raised just about 10 to date, um, which was also a really interesting thing because a lot of venture capitalists can't invest in vice, vice companies, so they can't invest in you know, tobacco, weed, Firearms, apparently wine falls in that category, but um, uh, and cannabis and all that, all that stuff. So uh, it was, it was definitely a challenge. Okay, good. All right, Sean, you are a successful entrepreneur. You went to LMU. We're very proud of you. Um, can you tell us the genesis behind starting Launch LA with, with Jen? Yeah. You were the yeah, honors company and go Lions. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so. You know, I had spent several years building a brand and building it along some very talented people. And one of those people was Jess Galvin, and that kind of enabled us, The Honest Company, to really cut through the noise. It's really hard to establish a brand, it's really hard to gain awareness, especially today, where it's very easy to spin up a direct-to-consumer brand, it's very easy to private label a product, and it's getting really expensive to do it in a way that you can actually be sustainable. 
because Facebook um, and Instagram and Google are taking more and more of the surplus that you could use then to reinvest in the company, to build a customer acquisition cost to a lifetime value model that actually makes sense. And so for us, we love creating. We're creators. We love tinkering. We love finding white space. And that gets us really excited and motivated and, and, and happy to get up in the morning. And so when we look at the world at large, we see, of course, trends changing, and of course, online purchase and, and intent continuing to increase. But people still shop offline. And the places that they shop are the places that they want to shop. So people shop online, they shop at mass, they shop at drug, they shop at retail, they shop at liquor, they shop at big box. They, they, they really have kind of their own ideas of where they want to shop. And so for us, we want to make that available to where they want to be. So we go in and we create a model that looks at the ever-changing or ever-evolving kind of landscape of how can you create a brand, cut through the noise, and actually build a business that's a business. Um, and one that hopefully you don't have to raise, not 10 million, but tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars because the idea behind a business, of course, at some point is to make money. Um, and the more money that you raise, getting up there, um, the more the decisions become more difficult with respect to you have to spend the money to get the next raise, and it's this ever-evolving cycle. So when we look at the landscape overall, we say, hey, let's build a business model that combines um, a marketing plan, given kind of uh, an A-list celebrity, let's, to cut through the noise, let's combine it with direct-to-consumer best practices, and then let's get retail involved. Uh, one of our primary partners is Walmart. 150 million people a week walk through a Walmart door. Uh, and what we learned very quickly about Walmart as we started talking to them is the buyers are millennials. They have kids, um, not, not all of them have kids that are young kids, but they have kids ranging from you know, newborns all the way to you know, older, older adults. And, and they care about the environment, they care about their impact, they understand their impact and they want to do it differently. And so when we're talking to them about where is the white space and where is the, where is the opportunity, they tell us that they would love a brand to come in and meet this objective or this need. And the incumbents, the big corporations, it's hard for them to innovate and innovate quickly. Um, the private label side, it's hard for them to innovate because they innovate out of brand for margin. And the, the kind of the current thinking of a lot of the digital companies are that what is going to master drug going to do to our aspirational audience of our direct to consumer basis? So we're really trying to build companies that number one, have a social conscious, number two, fill a white space with quality products that, that are natural, that are organic, that are clean, and that are also affordable. And affordable not only to the people on the coasts, but inside the middle of the country as well. And that's really kind of the origin of what we wanted to do is create brands, create, create businesses that have a social conscience that enable people to have better, healthier, healthier alternatives in the places and the locations that they want to buy from. Awesome. By the way, Sean is a, a recipient of a LMU's Wall of Honor Award. He's uh, enshrined forever on the wall of a, 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 a Hilton building in, uh, in, in, at LMU. Um, one thing I remember when I was uh, doing due, due diligence on him, he, uh, <laughs> he took a class in college called uh, Psychology of Women, and he did really well in that class. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I grew up with two sisters, and my first, uh, my first child was uh, a daughter, and so I think I've had more influence from women in my life overall than, than men. Perfect. I wonder you did so well in that class. Okay. Um, now, Jen, after spending many years in finance, you mentioned you made this big transition to uh, to go on your own uh, with with Sean. So, um, how did you make that transition, and what lessons have you learned in the process? Um, yeah. So I, I mean, first of all, I loved finance, or I loved my job. You know, so I, even after 17 years, I, I think it was still exciting. Every company was different, every investment was different. You look at companies that potentially are on the brink of bankruptcy. We were all in, uh, our company was focused on high-risk um, 
companies. So companies that are on the brink of bankruptcy potentially, trying to help companies get out of bankruptcy, uh, but also looking at companies that we can buy. Um, so, you know, it, it really, I think for me, uh, making this leap, um, it was a combination of timing, because 17 years, you know, I think you, you get to know everybody you want to know in the same industry. Um, also, financially, personally, I think it was a good place for me to take that risk. Um, and also, you know, that in combination with the opportunity, it was just something I couldn't say no to. I thought to myself, you know, a few years down the line, I'm really going to regret, you know, not doing this. And with a buddy of mine, so Sean and I went to business school together. Um, so we've known each other for 15 years. And to be able to work with a friend that you really trust and to build all, not just one company, but lots of different companies in different categories, like from the ground up, was just something I just couldn't say no to. So it wasn't that tough of a decision because I felt like I was leaving a, a family, you know, like lifelong friends, but joining a new family at the same time. And we've been able to hire some of our close friends as well that we thought, you know, we went to school with and we thought were really talented. Um, so, uh, and so I think along the way, um, you know, the lessons learned, I mean, some of it, you know, you, it's a, to first of all, it's a totally different industry, consumer products versus finance. I think a lot of things do carry across, right? Like I sat next in front of, you know, thousands of management teams. I can, I know why companies don't make it. And big companies too, right? So I know that cash flow is super important. Right? A lot of companies have too much debt on their balance sheets. Like you just kind of see the pitfalls and you know that certain management teams just, they don't know what they're doing. Um, and I spend years avoiding um, you know, trying to pick the winners and avoiding, you know, I think companies that, you know, I think will not survive. Um, so you can carry a lot of that into a new business. Granted, it's a startup, so it's, it's, you know, it's somewhat different. But you also, I think with my experience, I can help plan how we're going to capitalize the company, how we're going to fund this business, whether it's debt or equity, um, and then manage our cash flows. Um, on the flip side, we're, I think every other day we're like, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> like, what the hell have we gotten ourselves into, right? Like, it's, there are, I mean, I can't even say, you know, one lesson. There are just so many things we're learning every day from not having enough product to having too much product to, you know, how to manage a warehouse or logistics. I mean, there are just like major fire drills every day that we have to deal with. And um, we get through them. You know, and you learn along the way not to make that same mistake at the next brand, at the next launch. So, um, yeah, but lots of lessons. I can't, it's hard to pick one. Okay, we'll, we'll get to more. Yeah. All right, Jessica, your story is also interesting. You were in a lot of different jobs, and then you were in finance for a while, right? And then at some point you owned uh, daycare centers or uh, preschools, and then now you're uh, doing we care. Please tell us about the transition in all those uh, jobs, but at least it's the weekend. I think that's probably over a nice couple of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I actually started off in finance, um, and this was during the like pre-financial crisis years. So, you know, started off as an investment banker, did mergers and acquisitions, worked 100 hour weeks, um, and then jumped over on the private equity side. and. <laughs> Um, that was actually during the financial crisis, so I learned a lot about debt and then learned a lot about equity as well. Um, and what was interesting was when I was there, um, one of the last projects I worked on was to acquire a company and I was in charge of it and I was like, look, this is great, I know how much synergies are worth, I know how much employees we need to cut. And then they fired our whole integration team because it was during the financial crisis and they said, look, do you want to try to actually integrate this company in? I was like, okay, that shouldn't be hard, right? I've got this figured out. And I was completely wrong. <laughs> and it was one of probably the hardest jobs that I, I had to do because now I was responsible to fire half of the employees. And when you're actually dealing with people and looking at the operations, it's a lot harder. Um, and that's actually that time when I was like, look, I love finance, but one of the things was I consistently took apart companies and analyzed them on what they were doing wrong, and I wanted to actually build a company up. I said, look, 
There's so many things that I can learn. And as Jen said, you know what's wrong with the company. So let's actually take a step back and say, like, how do we build up a great company? And how do we build it up from the start? So ever since then, I've been an entrepreneur. And then I decided to have a child. And I was, at that time, a VP of Marketplace for a startup in LA. And I had absolutely no clue. It was literally the hardest thing I've ever done. You could tell me that I can't sleep for 120 hours a week, but literally having a kid scared me to death. Um, and at that time, I asked a lot of my friends for advice. And they were like, look, you'll figure all these things out, but childcare is actually the hardest thing that you need to do right now, and you need to figure that out. And then I got the Excel spreadsheets, I got the recommendations, I got the, hey, look, for this director, you need to make sure they make them cookies, they really love cookies. Uh, and I thought that was so amazing, because I was like, how, how come this is one of the hardest things that we have to figure out? How come someone hasn't gone out and figured this part out? Because this is actually a biggest transition for women, right? You're, um, you're in your career, you're starting to actually move up the ladder, and then you decide that I'm going to start a family, and then everything is thrown at you. It's like, well, you got to figure out what your childcare options are, you got to figure out the cost, because sometimes it's going to cost you two to three thousand dollars a month to send your kid to childcare. And then at the same time, it's all on you. And if you can't afford it, guess what? Give up your career, stay at home, and become a mom. Of course, there are people that love doing that, and I, I don't want to say that um, that's a uh, bad thing, but sometimes you're just forced to do so. And I thought that was really unfair. And that's actually when I thought about preschools, and I was like, look, this seems really interesting, but I don't know too much about it, so I went ahead and got a preschool, tried to figure it out, and really wanted to understand what was happening. Why is it that childcare is so hard? And after a, a number of years doing so, I decided that I was going to start a tech company saying, we have the ability to actually solve this problem. And we can do so by empowering women. On one side, we're empowering the, the moms out there and saying, like, look, you don't have to choose between your work and your career. Here's an affordable, convenient option that's going to work for you. And on the other side, we're actually empowering caregivers, who, by the way, are 97% females and 70% minorities. We want to help them make more money. It shouldn't be that a preschool teacher is making 20000 in a year. Why can't they be making three, four, five times that amount of money? So that's actually why we started We Care. And one of the other things I always like to say is like, it's not just about being mission driven, it's about being passionate and also believing that you're exemplifying that in your company as well. So in our own company, we are 70% female, and that's really hard for tech companies. And we're probably more, we have more minorities than anything else. So if you exemplify that in your own workplace, you can actually go ahead and solve the missions that you're trying to do. By the way, we're also hiring for any graduates out there. <laughs> By the way, you already hired two of my students, so thank you. We're trying to hire more. <laughs> Please, uh, take them all. Um, <laughs> right now, just drop out. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, you know, a lot of my students and many people here might want to build a tech product. Uh, I don't think you had an engineering background, right? So how do you build a tech product and how do you initially finance the first version? How, how might somebody go about doing that? So actually, when I went to college, I started off as an electrical engineering computer science major. So just to put that out there. But quickly, I went over to psychology. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't have a tech background, um, but I do have other co-founders. And we've worked well in the past, and I knew their abilities. But a lot of it comes down to a, a passion point and talking with um, your co-founder, who was um, our CTO, and really understanding, like, what are we trying to solve? And then going from there and saying, like, can we actually solve it? And asking the engineers, and like, can we do this? Yeah, yeah, OK, great, let's just go do it. Um, a lot of it comes down to the ideas and being able to actually map out those ideas uh, in a cohesive way, in a strategic way, and also making sure that there is a customer fit. 
you don't want to be creating something that is so great and then no one ever uses it. So one of the actual important parts of founding a tech company is having vision and product. Um, maybe this is something that you guys have heard before. Um, product really kind of sits in between that operations and tech side of it, but they're really the ones that are taking the vision and saying like, okay, what are the things that we need to build first and how do we build it and how do we make sure we can tell the tech guys, like, here's the roadmap to do so. So you actually need the vision and the tech to actually go ahead and build your vision. Okay, thanks very much. All right, uh, the next several questions go to everybody, but let's start with Alix. Um, so, you know, when people have ideas, they uh, you're supposed to validate your idea. And so, how did you validate your idea? And what so, so far, what surprising pivots have you made? Sure. So, um, I feel it's just totally inadequate next to all of you. Um, so so my, my story is actually pretty different. Um, I, I started the company totally by accident, actually. I was, um, well, I worked in finance for a couple years, but that was, you know, that was right after college, and I thought $70,000 in New York City was like explosively a lot, turns out. Turns out it's an explosively good way to, you know, end up with $10,000 of credit card debt. But anyway, and, um, so I, you know, I, I moved out to San Francisco when I was 24. And right when I got there, I actually had some medical problems. And um, I, I, went, I had an ovarian torsion and I actually had three in my right ovary. Um, and over the course of six surgeries in 18 months, as a 24-year-old who had no concept of what, you know, um, savings really was, uh, I, I was in a position where I, I had to freeze eggs um, and it wasn't covered by any health insurance, which is a whole other story that we can talk about all day long. But um, anyway, and so, and, you know, and it was like, it was 20 grand. It was, I guess, um, five, five or so years ago. I swear, I, just, I swear I'm answering the question in a little bit of a roundabout way, but I did what any 24 year old would do. And I, and I decided that it was time for me to throw ragers at my aunt and uncle's house and charge people tickets. Um, and I lived in Silicon Valley, so I was like, oh, all these guys are making too much money. They'll come hang out with my cute friends for $200. So, so anyway, true, true story. Um, so, so originally, you know, I, I, went to, um, I went to Dartmouth undergrad. It was, just, it was a very frat-centric place. Sororities, uh, I don't know if LMU has uh, Greek life, but sororities aren't even allowed to throw parties, right? Um, so you're, you're forced into these male-dominated spaces, which ends up being, you know, as, as we all know, quite quite dangerous for young women. Um, and this was something that had always bothered me. I'd had my own, you know, issues and experiences that I dealt with. And then, then I went into finance. Um, my first boss got fired for sexual assault of 12 women within the firm within my first three months of my first job. And I was like, oh, wow, this isn't unique to college. <laughs> <laughs> that was an upsetting realization. And then I moved out to Silicon Valley in the tech world, and I was like, oh, look, it's everywhere. Um, and so I originally actually started the company in my mind um, as a, a media events company. I wanted to build something that made it safer for women to have fun on their own terms. And um, and so that's that's actually how I ended up in, in LA because uh, I you know I was like oh I'm gonna do media I should know media they do that stuff down there um, and at this point uh, I have you know pretty much no I, I paid off my medical bills but I have like no money I'm you know I didn't I was not in a financial position to be starting anything um, except a new job really and. Um, and, and, and I just decided, I realized pretty quickly that if I wanted to build a brand that really spoke to these things, it had to be something that was tied to a product people interacted with. I couldn't just make this like amorphous media company. Because I moved, I got a note, like a notice to like change my address on my 401k and I was like, wow, I have $20,000. So I, so I cashed the whole thing, took all the penalties, I bought 300 gallons of rosé. And my parents were like, oh, Okay, <laughs> so you're, and I was like, don't worry, I'll, I'll end up really rich or really drunk one day, possibly both. Um, so, so that was kind of how I got started. I, I really wanted to build like a brand and a media company first, um, and realized that it needed to be tied to a product, right? And um, you know, and at that point, when I started the company, there was a point in time I had you know five dollars in my bank account, 
had maxed out all my credit cards to get it off the ground, was trying to get an Uber to get back to, an, to the airport, had to like call a friend on the East Coast because it was four in the morning and I was having a meltdown and no one was awake in California to get me a car, you know, like all, all that kind of stuff. And then ultimately, you know, ended up, ended up raising the funds to, to build the business. But, um, so the, I mean, the pivots, Every day is a pivot, <laughs> honestly, um, you know, and it's definitely not something that I spent a lot of time analyzing or doing. I mean, we've been kind of building the plane as we fly it, but I'll just say I think the whole thing is just full of twists and turns, and if you're someone who isn't, in, you know, have, hasn't built a savings or isn't in a financial position to feel like you can take on that risk, um, I, I actually like to tell people that the only way out is through. You have to have that mentality when you're starting your own business. Um, and and you have to tell yourself, like, I refuse to fail, I refuse to die. That is just like, that is the only thing I know, that I won't let myself do that. Um, and it's possible to do, you know, even even without the cushions that, that most people have, though I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean and Jen, I feel like you've gotten, not, done a lot of concept testing, validation, and pivots and stuff like that. Maybe one or two examples. We're, we're having a private conference. <laughs> <laughs> who's going who's gonna to talk about what brand? Um, so I, I think um, I'll start with our newest brand, Till Our Match. Um, you know, not a lot of people know about it, so it's a little bit of an advertisement, but I think a lot of you have a pressure cooker, right? Like a like an Instant Pot or a Ninja, or a lot, there are lots of brands out there. You don't mean your job. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, and uh, it's it's um, you know it's actually not that easy. I mean, you, it's a lot of prep work, uh, you know. And so I think for for us, the starting point was how do we create an innovative product that a retailer would want, um, that everyday people want to have access to, right? So we um, you know looked at several options and then landed on you know the pressure cooker being one of the biggest selling items on Amazon for the last you know five years. And um, you know, spoke to a lot of people that said, "Look, it's not instant. Um, you you have to prep for an hour and then wait for it to to pressurize and cook." So, um, so the idea behind that, um, you know, so we obviously checked in with uh, Walmart, our uh, initial retailer, but also we spoke to several other retailers that also were really interested in this idea. It's a, it's first of its kind. Um, and then we partnered with um, a guy, his name is Bruce Hecker. He is a, um, a large caterer for the media industry here in LA. So he has catered lots of celebrity events and media events, and he's very, very particular about his recipes. So he created, helped us create all these amazing recipes. The recipes that you cook at home, like chicken marsala or um, you know Louisiana stew, and they're hearty meals, right? So that you can take the frozen bag and just open it up, pop it in your pressure cooker, and 12 minutes later, um, you have a warm meal. And really, it, it's good. It's, you know, high quality ingredients in there, but also it's affordable. Um, so we, and, uh, and I should speak a little about, a bit about J-Lo and A-Rod. Um, you know, Who are these people? <laughs> you know, our, our partners. Um, I think, you know, they were really interested in this idea and, you know, very early on talked about, hey, how we want to give, find a way to give back um, to our communities, to, um, you know, they grew up, they, you know, J-Lo grew up in the Bronx, didn't have access to that. And she said, you know, you end up eating what you can. You don't have access to, you know, warm meals every day. Um, so I think she wanted to do something where she can, you know, consistently give back to the community, the communities that she were she was a part of, but also, you know, as she, uh, as people reach out when there are natural disasters, when you know, communities that really need help, she wants to be there, have an avenue to give back. So um, I think a lot of that partnership, you know, is um, based off of that, and that goes along with some of our other brands as well, there's a giving back aspect that we don't always talk about, but it's entrenched in the foundation of all of these brands. It's so interesting that you uh, talk to Walmart, your, your future customer, before you uh, even, uh, while you're analyzing 
uh, the the uh, idea, right? Yeah, I think our, the, you know the Walmart buyers and the VPs they know their space more than anybody, right? They are the experts on what the white space is, what they're missing, and, and so if they want to introduce one new frozen food brand, they're gonna they're gonna be able to tell us what exactly they need, and it's always good to partner with your your customer. From the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. So they're invested in it as well. This question goes to anybody other than Sean. So um, I've always wanted to ask this. Have you faced any special challenges as women entrepreneurs? Either when it comes to raising funds or managing your employees or anything like that? Anybody? No, I can talk about. Um, so actually, one of, the, one of the most frustrating questions I got, and mind you, I have an early childcare startup, was I would go into the VC meetings and they would actually ask me, how do you balance work and life? It's like, well, I'm here, why not? I'm giving you a solution. And that was actually really, I was like, why, why, why does it have to be me? You know, I have a partner in crime, my husband. How does he, shouldn't you ask that equally to my husband? Like, why am I the one that has to be taking care of my child and giving up my career? Um, so I thought that was um, pretty, pretty harshful. And then I said, like, okay, well, this is not the right VC. <laughs> uh, but you'd be surprised that there is, there's even after the Me Too um, generation, you know, there's still a lot of old school people in, in the industry. And their thought processes are still kind of the same. I think some of the other common ones I got was like, is childcare really that hard? <laughs> I was like, no. Oh, you better go home and thank your wife and make sure you get her like cookies and everything. Because say that to her and see what, you, <laughs> see what she says. Um, and so it is, <laughs> it is definitely, um, there's still a lot of stereotypes out there and consistently we are battling them. But the more female entrepreneurs that are out there, and the more female VCs that are out there, or kind of equal, uh, what is it called? balancing the playing field, or creating an equal opportunity for all the women out there. Can I, can I add something? Yes. So, um, so I work in a field that's still run literally by the mob. You can attest to that. Um, not a joke. <laughs> And um, you know, and and when I was fundraising, I was like, "Hi, yeah, I'm um, I'm 26. I have no experience in alcohol. It's uh, it, it is one of the most regulated industries, um, you know, in the country, aside from medical care. Um, and uh, and yes, I would like to, I would like you to give me 10 million dollars. And they were like, "You're out of your mind." Um, I think there there are two two big things. Um, I find being a woman in business to be such an asset because you walk into the room and you know that you are always underestimated every single time. And so because of that, you actually kind of have the power, right? So you walk in there and you can kind of, you can, you can play a little bit to your, you know, to, to who you're talking to because they're gonna, they, they're, you're, they're coming in with preconceived notions about how you're not good enough, generally speaking. And, um, and you know, and studies have shown that women generally are uh, assessed on potential, uh, or sorry, on performance, uh, and men are assessed on potential. Um, and so, you know, I've had friends or you know, co people in, in my network who are raising for beverage companies, and a lot of the time they're actually, you know, looked at as, oh, this guy can do so much, whereas women, it's like, show me what you've done, um, and, and that tends to be the case. Uh, but I also think that, that as particularly when you're fundraising or um, doing anything else, there's just a mentality shift. I attribute it sometimes to like dating, like women have never had to like go out and you know confidently ask ask people out that much. Um, but um, there, there's a there's a mental shift that, ha that has to be made. I think a lot of women go in and they're like, oh, I really you know I hope you invest. I you know as if it's a favor. Um, and. And when I started being able to actually raise capital for something that, frankly, nobody had any business giving me any money to, to do this, um, I, you know, a, a, t a turn went off where I was like, I'm gonna walk in like I'm Mark Zuckerberg, and I am the gatekeeper between what you want, which is the pot of gold I'm about to sit on, 
um, you know, and and you, and you're gonna have to basically sell me on why I should let you own some of my blood, sweat, and tears. And I think that's that's a little bit more natural um, to to men than it is to women um, to make that mentality shift and to and to build that confidence. Um, and so that's something that I think you know that that I've come across that that I think has been um, both challenging and awesome because you can you know. If you, if you know the cards you hold, you can run circles around people a little bit easier. I've got a lot, lot of questions, but I'm going to uh, leave the, uh, open up the floor for questions. Anybody like a question? Okay, there's Jason. Maybe, uh, shall we take one of the mics, maybe? I'll just, I'll just speak loud. Okay, thank you. I'm Sean, Jen, Jessica, thanks for sharing your time. Question for all of you. Growth of your companies, and congratulations on that, on that growth in your verticals. How has your personal leadership style changed or evolved to adapt to that growth? Jason, you ask that question at every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Entrepreneurship is such a is is such a journey of personal growth um, before anything else, honestly. And it took me a while to understand that when you say something to somebody, I you know, and I'm just, I'm a super transparent person, like to a fault. My team just kind of knows. Uh, you can ask Chloe over there. Um, but um, it took me a while to realize that I have to separate how I present. You know, um, like how I'm being received and not just how I'm feeling, right? Um, and what I mean by that is we've all had that one manager that said that one comment that like stuck with you and like said something or positive or negative, right? And that you kind of like held on to and it, you know, either knocked your confidence or built built you up or whatever. I imagine being a parent similar um, because as a child, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, scarred by my parents like every, everybody else. <laughs> but. But I think that's something that, that, that's had to change dramatically for me, where I, I suddenly realized I couldn't just be like, oh God, that's just that's just shitty work. Okay, let's talk about the next thing. But like really being a little bit more careful with um, you know, with how you're interacting, how, how you're being received, um, you know, and just being conscious of that constantly is something that I've learned a lot about in the, in the past, you know, two, three years. I think for me the constant is having great partners that you can really leverage each other's strengths and complement each other's weaknesses on. Um, you know, before I re-upped in Launched LA, I had a couple years to kind of figure out what it was and kind of how that would evolve for me. And I would, I would think about the most difficult period in that time was not having somebody next to me to bounce ideas off and to be constructive and to be critical. And that is so, so important when you're in business. At, at Honest, I have a, a handful of really close partners that we built synergies from each other, at launched the same, and so that I think is the one, the one constant, is really surrounding yourself with people that can complement you and, and, and really leverage each other's strengths and weaknesses. 
I'll just make the final comment on this. Um, I think as entrepreneurs, you when you decide to start a company, you think you're going to be able to do everything. And that's kind of that mentality. You go in and you're like, look, I'm going to be the COO, I'm going to be the CFO, I'm going to be whatever you need me to do, I'm going to do it. And as your company grows bigger, you actually have to take that responsibility off of you. And you have to be more focused on whatever your role is. Like for me, it's about strategy, thinking about the 10x return. And you have to trust that another person is actually going to be better than you at doing that role that you're handing off. And that is actually probably the hardest part for a lot of entrepreneurs. It's like, wait a minute, I'm really good at this, but guess what? That person's actually going to be better, and you have to trust them and let them manage. I'm getting the sign that uh, lunch is ready. So, in, uh, let's, let's finish off this way. So, in, uh, it's a little hard, but in maybe one word or one quick phrase, what's your advice to aspiring entrepreneurs that you might want to give? Anybody, uh, feel free to start. <laughs> I already said mine. Grab, grab a good partner or two or three, whatever, whatever it takes. A good partners, very good. Just start, and the only way out is through. I said just get started, and then after that, the only way out is through. Okay, good, good. Start get going. <laughs> um, just don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> There's no sleep. Make Drink a sure lot of coffee. Drink a lot of coffee. Lot of coffee. <laughs> Make sure you hire great people. With that, I'm also doing a little plug. <laughs> We're hiring. Sorry. Gary's right there. You can ask her. Awesome. Well, thank you for being so open and so informative. Thank you for offering such valuable lessons. How about a big hand for our panel? So, lunch is ready, darling? All right. So, I think we have gifts for all the panelists. Another hand for everybody.